Welcome back to Noble Warrior Live. This is a place where entrepreneurs talk about what it takes to build purpose-driven organizations. We're going to focus on mindset. We're going to focus on mental models. We're going to focus on actionable tactics such that not only you are inspired and motivated, but you can also take on these actionable tactics to experiment with your own business. Today, I'm really excited to have my friend Peter Matthews with us today. He is a, a former partner in private equity, venture capital funds. He's been a founder himself. He's been an author and lecturer, a speaker on a variety of different topics. He now runs a program that helps entrepreneurs to up-level their consciousness, their conscious business. And, and that program has been applied to organizations from an uh, organization of one to 100,000 employees, including Starbucks, BMW, Siemens, Intel, and many others. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much, CK. It's wonderful to be here. Now, I do want to ask you, why did you leave all of those things behind and do an educational program? But before I jump in there, I wanted to ask you, my friend, in this crazy times right now, how are you able to ground yourself, ground your family? What kind of things do you do to make sure that everything starts there? Yeah, well, well, first of all, honestly, if if I would be saying I'm, I'm grounded all the time, I'd be lying. <laughs> and probably everyone else would be too. What I do is I start the day with a 20 minute meditation. I have a certain um, kind of a ritual that I do uh, with breathing techniques, with checking in for myself, with connecting to the higher guidance. And I find myself uh, doing that frequently. I've actually, the second thing that I'm doing is I'm yeah. taking walks. Be before go you go be before mm -hmm. you move forward, uh, further, any specific kind of breathing uh, techniques? There's some yogic breathing techniques that center me, that work with my with my stomach, and then there's a breathing technique that I have where I bring bring in here into my center and then let it stream out through my legs and through my arms. There are a couple of rounds of that, and then I keep it in my body, and so I kind of wash out the old energy and then uh, refresh with fresh run and then keep it percolating through my body. And that's a little bit like an inner sanitation <laughs> for me in the morning. So as you breathe, you visualize this new water comes through you, wash out the old and bring in the new. And then that's your yeah, visualization yeah. that you breathe. Let's do it for 30 seconds maybe. So maybe sure. we can just breathe in through your head and... As you take a deep, deep breath in, bring it into your center and hold it there for a minute or for a few seconds. And then exhale it through your legs, through your feet into the ground. And then do that once more. Bring it into your center, through the crown of your head. Let it sit and expand there for a little bit. And through your legs, through your calves, through your feet into the ground. And the same now, bring it into your heart. Keep it there for a moment. And now out through your arms, through your fingers, exhale. And you might actually feel your hands tingling a little bit. And then the last part of this is to bring it in. Expand it into all limbs of your body, down into the legs, but keep it there. And as you breathe it back in, bring it back into your center and into your heart. And then just breathe out. So this is just a quick one, but if we do this a little longer, you can actually feel that it, it cleanses your body. I like it. Mm -hmm. Already, I feel a, a much powerful presence and more grounding. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that with all of us here. Yeah, you're welcome. That's beautiful. Helps me too. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. That's great. We should start all podcasts like this. Actually, uh, you don't notice. I don't know if you ever had hape before, jungle tobacco. So I have not. You, 
so when we do a noble warrior recording typically we're doing it in person mm -hmm. i would actually introduce them this jungle tobacco called hape it's very similar in the outcome but it's very very grounding so you say snuff that it's administered through the nose and it's it's super grounding in like 10 seconds so Nice. So next time we see each other in person, I'll I'll share. All right. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of my of my shamanic things in the Amazon. <laughs> yeah. It, it came from the Amazon. Yeah. yeah perfect. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I had no idea you did that. That's that's, yeah. uh, that's great. <laughs> okay. So you do your breathing. You you're about to say that you go out for a walk. Yeah, I do meditation. Then I just try to feel the nothingness around me, and I actually feel my hands reach out with my entire awareness and then just listen to the nothingness there actually and bring it out as far as possible but listen to the stillness and usually do that in my chair but then also when i go for a walk i try to do that because when we listen beyond the words beyond the noises we can we can listen to the silence out there there's a moment of just presence and so i'm trying to sit in that and then listen to what comes comes from there yeah, so that's that's kind of my morning ritual. And then when I when I go for walks, I try to connect with nature. Nature does a lot for me. So I try to sit with the trees and I just become present with with nature. And thank goodness here in Santa Barbara, we can go out and take a walk by the beach if not too many people are around or hit the mountains. And that helps a lot. You're very fortunate that way, my friend. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for the entrepreneur who's listening to this, they may be still in that transition right now, right? Whereas they may be thinking like, holy shit, CK and Peter, during this time, I got a business to take care of. I got a business to pivot. I don't have time to do these luxurious things like sit in silence and meditate and do breath work. What would you say to them? I'll start with one minute. I learned that from a monk, from a person who used to be a business guy, quite successful, and then he dropped everything and became a monk for 12 years and really learned about the mind very powerful person he now lives in new york bless his heart and he works a lot with executives which high le high level executive which are so busy that they usually don't have any time for anything so he says start with one minute just start with one minute and sit and just think of nothing just be in that presence and try to think of nothing for one minute half a year later if you're done with that you can switch to two minutes <laughs> So if if you don't have a minute to do that or two minutes, then I think we have a problem that we need to talk about. <laughs> yeah, mm. So that would be my recommendation. I think I plus, heard... Go ahead. Yeah, plus um, maybe what I want to say around this COVID time, because there there's a lot of opportunity to freak out. Things are happening that are not very beautiful. People are passing away. There's a lot of stress out there. If you read the media, it's feeding the stress like crazy. But at the same time, if you look around, it's only maybe a tenth of a percent of humanity. If you look at nature, if you look at animals, if you look at everything that's affected from this, if you look out there, most of it is okay. Animals, nature, they're all having a good time. So realize that this is a huge opportunity that we're facing because our traditional systems, which we are operating in, are not sustainable. They're not sustainable for us. They're not sustainable for society and they're not sustainable for the environment. So the transition is needed. And we are at a time where we're going through this transition, which can be painful, but it's also a humongous opportunity. So my recommendation would be not to miss that opportunity. Yeah, like, like everything. So the word crises in Chinese as two characters. One is danger and the flip side is opportunity. We can definitely focus on the danger part and our egoic mind, our survival mind, our, our, our animal mind loves that because yeah. it keeps us safe and, 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 and well, survival. So at the mm -hmm. same time, I think if we are able to broaden our perspective a bit, is speaking in business terms, during crisis time is is when wealth is made really right if you're speaking from the business uh, opportunistic point of view so when everyone else is retracting there's great opportunities if you're able to actually broaden your horizon broaden your perspective and and and, and look changing analogy a bit to go to where the waves are going right 
faster. So paddle there. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So in thinking about opportunities per se, so one is to ground yourself such that you can come from a place of being centered and grounded versus being from panic and overwhelm. So first thing you do that. So now we're jumping forward a bit, looking at different opportunities. Are there practices that you use as a way to observe which opportunities to pursue? Yes, there are. The first practice is to be mindful about what you take in. There's a lot of media out there. There's a lot of information that flies your way. I'm looking at my phone here and I get 90 text messages every day from groups and from people that are that are out there and they're posting like crazy. So I'm very mindful about where the consciousness, where the information comes from, from which consciousness that I take in. Because most information that you find out there is coming from a consciousness of fear. Uh, if you if you look at the traditional media, it's all fear based. It's all sensation based, and that's not that's causing more fear. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to expose myself to that. At the same time, I want to take an information to stay informed, so I can make informed mm -hmm. decisions. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm consciously choosing information sources there that I know come from a different from a different mindset, from individuals that are looking at a bigger picture, from individuals that have done their homework, from individuals that are seeing the opportunity in this and are not coming from a completely fear-based mindset. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one one practice that I would definitely recommend. Doing. Any any specific individuals that we can point yeah, to? Yeah, I'm part of this group called the Evolutionary Leaders. It's, mm -hmm. it's a group of people, Deepak Chopra's in there, uh, Rinaldo Brutico, Neil Donald Walsh, spiritual teachers but also business leaders uh, it's a group of 190 or 200 people now that are, that are in this global global community mm. and uh, you can look it up evolutionaryleaders.net and there are a bunch of resources on there on about like recommendations what people say you can do in these times uh, i listen to the world business academy to to ronaldo brutico he's he's a very sharp guy and i know that he comes from a different mindset from a more holistic mindset so that's uh, some of the information that I that I look at. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so so be very choosy, be very selective about where you gather your information from, and you share two resources for us to look at. These are more of the holistic, conscious leaders that you select, not just thinkers, but also doers. Right? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there for me to? for the listeners who are watching this, for them to look at the different opportunities. Yeah, I read the media. I read selected, like BBC, for example, I'm, I'm reading, or I read some German newspapers because I'm German. I'm reading, obviously, some United States newspapers as well. I'm purposefully reading things that I otherwise would not read to see how they spin, spin, the, <laughs> spin the wheel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which uh, is a very interesting little exercise. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I get together with people on the call or just, just try to find sources where we can actually exchange on a strategic level what implications that, ha that has. Mm -hmm. uh, we're speaking with our clients, which are large organizations and some, some people that we are just in touch with, how they're dealing with this crisis. And out of those conversations, there are always new opportunities coming. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked with one huge tech company here in the United States, and they're actually saying they're they're much more productive yeah because traffic is up because people are going online and mm -hmm. since their people are staying home they're actually more productive because most of, most of them are coders mm -hmm. and so they're sitting at home don't need to talk to anybody else and they can yeah. code away <laughs> <laughs> i'm an introvert so i i understand yeah I yes yeah uh, and some of us actually enjoy this time but the problem is that there's no balance anymore the, the the workouts that they usually go to are just taking a walk or talking to some friends on the street or go out for a beer is not happening anymore mm -hmm. so the default mechanism is to go back to another screen mm -hmm. yeah and and work more which which closes these individuals down over time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like for example the male paradigm oftentimes is we, we we just do work 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 and two months later Sometimes it happens to me. I feel that I've been depressed like for months now. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We don't we don't check in with ourselves, and that that causes a ripple effect into how teams interact with each other, which is really negative. 
and many of the leaders out there are really concerned about that. Mm. How do we manage over distance in a way that we can still connect with our people on a on an emotional level so that those breakdowns don't happen in teams? So that's mm. that's an opportunity right there. Mm. Yeah, to offer something that to do that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're social animals as a whole. And for the introverts, they may like the alone time a bit, but ultimately it's the yin and the yang, right? We still need that socialization aspect of it. Otherwise, depression, PTSD, these type of things, we are starting to see that already. A lot more people are saying, hey, I'm lonely, I'm getting stir crazy, and I need that human contact, and they are not getting it. So what's anticipated is, as you said, a rise, a spike up in, you know, people that need that help, you know, depression, PTSD, or, or whatever ways that they can get in it to, to get their, the mind, the, the mental health aspect of it in place. Is there anything that you see to address this in the broad spectrum? Because it, here's my assertion, people that know on the, let's say on the, on the far end of the spectrum, they know they're clinically depressed. They know where to, they know how to have a thing right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then then there's the minor stuff that's in between and some people are doing great but there, there's somewhere in the in the middle where they may be feeling oh i'm just a little upset i'm a little depressed and, and i notice that i'm addicted to netflix more I'm, I'm drinking wine more i'm eating chocolate more i'm giving <laughs> into my addiction more right like it's okay but it's still not on the clinical level yeah. so yeah. How, how do you address the bulk of the people who are in the middle yeah, I think have everybody seen, else. Have, have. have you seen any like any companies, organizations that's trying to address this part? Because this is a huge yeah. part. Yeah, yeah. We're just talking to three actually, which are looking at addressing that because they see it in their team. Uh, and I think pretty much everybody deals with that on some level. Uh, like for myself, the last two days, I've just been really sad, really sad. And I know it's something that comes from me because I've been working very hard during the last year and I've overworked. Yeah. So now it comes the depression because I was under pressure and now it's depression and it's actually a good thing. So if, if I just plow through that, I, that's not good. So I'm, I'm actually, first of all, I'm, I'm becoming aware of it, which, and not run away from it. So I'm spending time in my, on my, in my living room and I observe myself more than usual when I sit on my chair, for example, and usually I want to get up and I want to go back work or some idea comes and I want to pick up the phone and we have our rhythms. Yeah. And I, I try to break those pattern and, and quote unquote, force myself to sit on the chair for 10 minutes longer. And my entire body goes, I, I need to do this now. I want to do this now. And I'm still sitting there. When I do that, I go over this hump where suddenly something new comes up. Mm. and calmness comes up so what i encourage people to do is to look at those patterns those urges and to resist them resist them a little bit sit a little longer just stare at the tree outside yeah mm. the second thing i want to say around that is that uh, a friend of mine who i value a lot he says depression is a good thing because depression is a sign that we have suppressed something for a long time mm. So the question becomes when we feel depressed to not take it personal and say, I am depressed. It's like, I feel depression and it's, it's just, I have it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's not me. It's something that is like a blanket that's over me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it covers the real me up because the real me is not depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but to uncover that blanket is to say, what have I suppressed for a long time? For, for me, for example, when I was working so hard, is really to take a little bit of playtime, mm -hmm. be out and be lighthearted and, and have a good time instead of just heads down working. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the part of me says, my God, that's, damn, I'm, I'm depressed about that. Mm -hmm. I suppressed that part of me. So this is the opportunity now to actually take time to spend time on these in, in inquiries, which which are really important because they're really about our happiness and, mm -hmm. and our well-being. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, that specific way of thinking about it. Is in mm -hmm. my mind, I don't know if you've ever done any shamanic ceremonial work before or psychedelics. Mm -hmm. It's very, very similar in that way where you're experiencing a lot of intensity 
physically, mentally, emotionally, perhaps spiritually as well. And, and, but that also gives you us the opportunity to choose and to try that on what we want to do with it afterwards. Right. So mm -hmm. in the way that your language, I really like is like a, a blanket that you wear. I have it. I'm not it. Then you can actually provide some mental distance from that. Yeah. And then in the midst of it, and then, then you can choose and then, then be with it. And then, and then, and then until something new ha happens, it actually reminds me of, I don't know if you watched the documentary called free solo with uh, one of the world. Yeah, the, the, the climber, guy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, no. oh. yeah. So, so free solo, I'm... Alex Han Hemel, I believe that's his last name one of the top three solo mountain climbers, he climbed 3000 feet of El Capitan in Yosemite mm -hmm. without rope. Mm -hmm. It was telling basically that's what the documentary is about. But one of the key thing that shows up for me, as we were describing this is a lot of people would think of him as being fearless, but he actually, when he experienced fear, he just kind of just sit with it. There was a moment in that documentary where he was experiencing fear and just like see, uh, sit with it until that fear washes over him. Then he yeah. can continue to move forward. So it's very, very similar in that way. Yeah. I mean, you, you're talking about such an important topic because this is a noble warrior here. So I believe the world is a classroom for overcoming fear and, and we never overcome it <laughs> because yeah. there's always going to be fear. The question is how do we show up in, in the face of fear? Is it, is it going to let us run our lives or are we still moving forward with our convictions and stuff? So we're all warriors here. We're all warriors. We're all on the mat in the dojo training. And the, the, the classroom is right now with COVID when we're confronted with a lot of challenges and we're getting hit with stuff. The classroom is when we're sitting in meetings and we're having conflicts or we're just totally overwhelmed with work. That's our classroom. And the question is, how do we deal with that? What, how do we show up in the face of those challenges? Are we falling apart and bitching around? Or are we becoming warriors? Which is not to fight, but to be in, centered and to be emotionally capable to deal with those situations and make the most out of it. The noble warriors, as you say. <laughs> Uh, I just have chills and thank you so much for getting my intention with this podcast. The whole point of noble warrior is not so much, Hey, do this and you conquer it. And that's it. You have arrived. The whole point of it is who you're going to be in the face of adversity challenges, you know, things that difficulties, you know, in, in life, because who we get to be in the face of it. Adversity reveals who we really are. So now you have an opportunity to actually deal with places in life may be a little weaker, but what a blessing, what an opportunity for us to, to grow forth. Right. So thank you for getting us. So appreciate yeah. that. So, but one may say, so I'm going to challenge us on that point a little bit, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. One may say, Hey, CK and Peter, it's easy for you guys to say, face your challenge, face your fear, face your adversity. You live in Santa Barbara, you know, <laughs> you have a nice, you're, you're, you're set financially. You're, you have all these accomplishments you can lean back on, but my house is on fire. I, I, I it's, I, I'm overwhelmed. I'm in panic mode, I'm in fear mode. Mm -hmm. How do you, is there anything concrete, anything specific, anything actionable, anything tactical that you can advise them to just yeah yeah i mean that's those are the situation where the rubber meets the road obviously yeah, yeah. I, I live in santa barbara but i have to say i came here in 2003 i was doing quite well but after i founded the conscious business institute which came to me in a, in a half sleep it took me about seven years to get it started so i had a long long time where it was tight and i burned through pretty much all my money i was down to a, a tiny little bit i was freaking out i couldn't tell i was sitting here i was crying i was saying i need to get a job again and my wife said if you don't follow your purpose i'm gonna fire you peter 
So she was supporting me in, in following my purpose, bless her heart. <laughs> I'm so grateful for that. But I, I know exactly the fear that you're talking about because it's it's paralyzing. And yes, if if something happens, if our house is burning, we need to get out of there. Yeah, we, we need to get the water. There are, there are crisis situation where we need to deal with the situation. If a truck is running towards us, we need to get out of the way. It doesn't help to sit there and meditate and, oh, the truck's just a friend. It's not happening that way. So we need to do what whatever happens. So when I talk to people, I, I tell them that uh, fear and fantasy is the same thing. We're both... Say more about not, that. Say, say more about that. Fear and fantasy. Say fear and fantasy are really the same thing. In both instances, we are not in our authentic power. We are operating out of power. Mm. And when we operate out of power, we create a negative ripple effect for ourselves. We create stress or we create a negative ripple effect for the world. So fear is clear. Our house is burning down. Holy shit, I'm running out of money. We, I need to do something. But some people are also doing fantasy. They're saying, oh, I'm just following my dream and I'm building this company. And everything will be great. And oh, I'm going to be saved. And sometimes they're flat on their face as well. Mm. So it's, it's the same delusion that we have of reality. So what we can do if we are afraid is, first of all, to realize that we are afraid and that we are not in our authentic power. It's to notice that because whenever we do stuff, it, it creates a ripple effect. However, we need to get out of, this, out, out of the way from the truck. So if, if the company is burning down, we need to do whatever we can to make it sustainable. Yeah, otherwise it, it's not gonna, gonna survive. It's just gonna happen. However, we can separate in accordance to our values and say, how do I wanna show up in this? Do I just wanna kick everybody out? Or do I want to have a conversation with my people to say, how can we manage this together? Can we maybe cut our salaries down to 50% for, or can we help each other? Or can we take a break? Or uh, it's, it's in that phase, it's really important to consider your values and say, how do I want to show up? I want to be fair. I want to connect to people. Yeah. I don't want to be an asshole, quote unquote. Yeah. So what would that mean? And I think for everybody, there's a, there's a, it, it means something different, but to sit with that and consider that. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> Let me give it back to you what I heard. Okay. Let me break that down yeah. a little bit. By the way, you don't know me that well enough. I'm that guy who would like underline, Hey, that was really profound. Let me give it back to you what you heard. Anyway, I'm that guy at, at a party even. Okay. okay. What I heard is get grounded first and foremost, and then take an inventory of what your values are. Hey, I'm committed to community. I'm committed to integrity. I'm committed to being fair, whatever your personal values are, and then operate from that point. Let me conserve my cash. Let me have a conversation with my colleagues and negotiate what a fair term may be such that we can continue this business operation per se, or, you know, let everyone go very quickly such that they are free to do whatever it is that they want to do for themselves based on your own personal values. Is that what I hear correctly? Yes. Yeah. I'll give you another example for my, for my own life is let's say I'm losing a client. Yeah. And a big client and I'm like, holy shit. So what I usually have a tendency to do in my MO is to go out and sell and oversell and all those kind of things. So if I, that's my usually MO, which a lot of people have, by the way, there's a typical system that we have to determine that. If I operate from that way, I'm going to create, create a negative ripple effect for myself, for other people. I'm not in my power. So I realize that and then I can switch to something which helps me is to, to shift to contribution. From insignificance, I'm not good enough, this is not good enough, it's not enough, to how can I contribute? If I switch to that, the conversations that I have with my clients are completely different. How can I contribute to this business in your time? How can I contribute to you? I'm not coming from fear, but from a place of abundance because I can do that mind switch when I think of that. Does that make sense? It does. Perfect. So now that you have, so I, I love that we're kind of doing step by step. So now you have had a conversation with your team. You've, you've, you have a clear, more clear direction what the next steps are. Then you get in communication with your top clients from a place of service and contribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens in those conversations? 
um, I just want to make it super concrete, right? So say I call you, Peter, like, hey, Peter, top client, love to have a virtual lunch with you. What do you talk about? Yeah, I'll give you a concrete example because we are obviously there are some programs that we wanted to do in Italy, for example, which have been canceled. So I'm, I'm feeling the pinch in some levels and I'm getting new programs on another level. But we sat down with our with our core team and said, you know what, this is this is a crisis. Oh, my God, programs are getting canceled. But at the same time, there is so much opportunity. People are going to freak out. So how can we be of com contribution? Here we go mm -hmm. to to those organizations. So we started reaching out to to our friends, having having chats and and asking how what's happening for you, uh, how are you, um, how are your people doing, and so we learned from those organizations and and we created a set of programs that help now specifically in these times of transition here, and we are reaching out to those organizations and, and saying um, here are these programs which would really help you engage your clients over distance and what we've heard. If you're interested, let us know. Yeah, we would like to help you manage those situations and we get a lot of good feedback. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so it doesn't come from the place of, oh my God, there's not enough. I need to somehow get this client. It really comes to, we need to contribute to what's happening out there in a positive way. Yeah. And in that spirit, those programs have been created and people feel that. Yeah, you actually mentioned a really good word here. It reminds me of this quote. People don't always remember what you do or what you say, but they'll always remember how you make them feel. Mm -hmm. right? Especially at a time where people, you know, everyone is looking for more certainty. How we show up as leaders, I believe, matters more now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Because if you're like everyone else who is adding to the fear and the panic and the overwhelm, they're not going to appreciate that in the long term because then they're going to remember how you make them feel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't spin my wheel faster. I'm already running as fast right, as I can. Right, right, right. <laughs> Let me be that stabilizing force and bring more certainty and, and clarity. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. And I also hear in between the lines, there's a faith in that there's there's more to go around this is not a place of scarcity because ultimately people are still building and spending and and all of that is is that correct i don't want to project but is that accurate in yeah yeah terms? that's actually a great point um thanks for bringing that up because there's there's really all our fear comes down to not enough yeah of, it's a, it's our scarcity monkey mindset that we've been educated with that that we are we are not enough there's not enough money there's not enough love and ultimately ex we we took it on for ourselves so everything that we do in our world which is fear or stress based is based on that mindset there's not enough we are not enough so everybody of us is running around trying to compensate and saying okay i i need to get enough enough money enough love enough whatever it might be uh, but that's just the mindset. So the the most important mind shift we can do to get in power and to build successful businesses, quite frankly, it, it is to shift to a mindset of enough. There is enough, which is very difficult if your house is burning down, right? But whenever you feel a fear of anything or frustration or anger or something, you will find behind that there's something not enough of. You want something to be different or there's not enough of something. If you would put yourself into the mindset, there is enough money out there. There's enough opportunities out there. There are enough people to fall in love with. There are enough businesses to build. It, it shifts your, you can feel it in your body, how it shifts your perspective. Yeah. And if you build a business, you, you, you will feel in that business a pinch, something that doesn't work out well if you have that not enough mindset. So it's a good exercise to do in any case to check out how can I shift to this mindset of abundance? So how can you shift that mindset? Because on the intellectual level, it's, you know, you, you, you hear Reverend Beckwith said to me, by me, through me, as me, right? These levels of like ways to think about the circumstances that's happening, like mm -hmm. intellectually, very inspiring. Yes. Yeah. In the fire right and something is the truck is coming your way like holy shit so how do you is there anything tactical that you can advise them to take on 
this uh, mindset of abundance. Yeah. Do, do you have a thing where you don't feel abundance in some way? Frustration I... or, or, or concern around something in this time? Personally? Play with that. Yeah. Otherwise, I can find something from my life. Yeah. Not, I mean, so, okay, so I'll make it personal. So one thing that I'll say is what spirituality did for me because I've been trained as a scientist and as a scientist, if you can't see it, you can't touch it. It doesn't exist. But it wasn't until I actually had some spiritual awakening and experience where I really like, holy shit, there's more to the tangible material world, right? That mm -hmm. I'm willing to try these things on. So that part actually really helped me open my eyes to a place of, you know, abundance. As in, yeah. there's more than enough. There, it's not just enough. There's like, it's so abundant everywhere, whether it's people that we love, the finances, you know, everything, everything. Mm -hmm. So, but, but that's, that's faith, right? Faith is in believing it without evidence. That's the second most important shift we can, the second most important shift we can do. One is from not, a, not enough to abundance. And the other one is from we're isolated to there's something bigger out there. We can talk about that in a second, but but I'll give you an example about the abundance thing. So let's say yeah. uh, you feel you're running out of money. Yeah, mm -hmm. Damn, I'm, I've got don't have a job, etc. Sure, sure. Um, and I'm not saying that it's easy because this is where the rubber meets the road here, um, mm -hmm. and it's always easy to say it and to actually do it, but to actually stop and realize. I'm, I'm in fear right now. I'm not in my authentic power. If we don't stop, we are on a roller coaster and, and life runs us. Yeah, we're, we're not in our power anymore. So the first thing is we have to do and stop and say, I'm, I'm really afraid here. I'm, I'm running out of money. And then you can maybe realize that what, what does money stand for? It gives you freedom, right? It gives you independence. It gives you well-being. What are the feeling states that the money gives you? In my case, it would be independence. Yeah. So what's really missing for you is not money, but independence. Mm. Yeah. And so by going to these feeling states, what's, what's, what is it actually beyond what you, what you're missing? Uh, freedom, independence in this case, you can find freedom and independence in many ways. Mm. Yeah. You can take a walk in the woods <laughs> if COVID is not around. <laughs> you can sing your throats out and, and sing a song or something like that. There, there are many ways that we, that we can experience the same feeling state that money would give us, the same independence, taking a walk in the, in the neighborhood. Our body doesn't distinguish whether we get it through money or through a walk in the woods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By that, we nurture that feeling state that's important to us, that the money gives us. And we become more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's an exercise that there's always enough of what we call essence, the feeling states that we want out there. Mm -hmm. If we can identify what those are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. I love that. It's similar to, so if you think about money as a proxy to the end emotional payoff that you get, right? Again, translate that to, the Netflix, the chocolate, the wine, the whatever it is that you do, it's very, very similar. Think about that as a mechanism. That's not the thing, but what is the payoff? And then you can choose the different mechanisms that give you similar payoff as an example, right? Yeah, this is this is a huge, it makes a big difference. It's a very simple concept, but this changes the way we run organizations. This changes our lives. This essence concept is if we want to switch away from running business and dominating and making more to something that's more life-giving, that's the concept we can switch towards because everything we do in life, everything is to experience essences, the feeling states that gives us, gives that to us. If we want to build a beautiful house by the beach, it's not about the house. It's about beauty. It's about abundance. It's about achievement. It's about the feeling of, I can I can be at home here. It's all about feeling states in our life. Life is a feeling experience, it's not a doing experience. So if we become aware of these essences that are really driving us, we can find that there are only about 10 to 15 that drive us for for everything we do. We can have one sentence. What did you say? 10 to 15? 10 to 15 feeling states that drive us that really oh. are the drivers for our life. So every decision that we make. For us to have a conversation here is to fulfill the feeling state. 
Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Do you have a list of those 15 states somewhere? It's right up on, on the wall. Okay, yeah. great. For, for me, everybody has their own, but it's right up on the wall. It says joy, creativity, ease, freedom, and those things. Got it. So yeah. it's a personal feeling state. It's to, you concretize that for yourself. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. So if I make choices in my life, I try to make them in accordance to that list mm. instead of the future outcome. Mm. Okay. So if you don't mind going a little deeper here, mm -hmm. one of the podcast guests, Jason Earl, he made a distinction of deliciousness versus nutritiousness, right? He says mm -hmm. chocolate, wine, Netflix, these are delicious things. Mm -hmm. Give you a temporary state of euphoria. And then there's, let's say, a healthy salad, delicious, but then it's nutritious, rather. It's not as good tasting as chocolate, wine, Netflix, but holistically, it gives you that uh, more sustainable, uh, wholesome, holistic sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So when you choose that emotional state that you had just talked about, how do you discern which is which you know what i mean not quite <laughs> yeah, you don't. okay sorry so let me let me see if i can clarify uh -huh. so say you said you had said that you want independence freedom right that's the emotional end point that you want but delicious you know a short-term mechanism may be let me i don't know do uh, let me go to take a walk on the beach, right? Mm -hmm. This is like that will give you a immediate payoff of independence. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know you don't want to spend all your day walking around the beach all day, right? So how do you discern how much to to take on? Yeah, it takes it takes some introspection. Yeah. So, so for example, I, I give you an example. Like I work with a with a woman in a large organization, her way on top of her list was independence. Yeah. But once, once she changed her job inside that organization, ultimately left actually, independence became lower on her list because she had it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are these authentic feeling states that we really desire and they don't change. I always would like to have freedom. I always like creativity. I always like joy, those things. I always like my part of adventure. Yeah, that's, that's, really who I am and what drives me. And then there are some which I put on top of it if they don't get fulfilled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If if I if I'm in a pinch and I've been locked down in COVID for four weeks, mm -hmm. freedom might kind of get get a little more of a booster here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm asking myself if I'm in balance, would I want to have this now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or am I just medicating? Like okay. Netflix and stuff. Okay, great. That that's a very concrete a mental filter one could take on. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm in balance, would I continue on this? I appreciate that. Thank you. That That's mm -hmm. very, very helpful. Yeah. So you also had mentioned you want to make a second point about faith. Yeah, I find there really, if we want to grow in our consciousness and be more empowered in the world uh, with our relationships, but in business as well, the one shift is from scarcity to abundance, mm -hmm. Yeah, which we've just talked about. The second shift is from uh, an understanding that we are really not who we think we are, this physical body and stuff, that there is something bigger out there, maybe something higher that we call spirit or whatever it might be for everybody, but there's an interconnection and that we're not alone here. Yeah, and that there's a bigger, bigger plan of all of this mess here. <laughs> Why is that so fundamental? Because we are not out there doing it by ourselves. Because if we don't have that, we're just out there making it and we're pushing people away and the, the strongest person wins and we're creating a world that, that we see around us. If we come from a perspective of oneness, um, which we can talk about whether that's true or not, everything changes because suddenly there's a higher perspective. And even if I check out here, I'm, I'm not gone. I might come back or I'm there, my soul doesn't die. And there is a bigger picture here that wants to be fulfilled and it's okay. Yeah. So it gives me personally a lot of peace of mind living in that mindset. Mm. Let me reflect back on what I, what I hear in, in my own story as a scientist, when I was younger, 
my perspective was let me go make it happen let me mm-hmm. meet individual make it happen mm-hmm. and it was a a lonely process it was just everything is like exerting everything is survival and it wasn't until as i developed myself along the way i realized i'm part of the whole so community right and also ultimately we're all part of the collective whole i'm a i'm an individual wave let out of this infinite ocean of consciousness right <clears throat> so for you peter had you always had this belief the collective whole and all that or was there a a singular awakening moment that have you now believe this i think there was always an inkling although i wasn't educated with it so i lived separated for most of my life up to probably 30 years old there was a there was a shifting moment when i met my mentor and friend he's up in carmel and he's a guy who who's a psychic and who sees people for who they truly are. So the first time I met him, he didn't know me. He'd never seen me before. I sit in front of him and he talks for three hours who I am, <laughs> what my soul is here to do, what my, my, my relationship, my parents, my siblings, my conflicts that I have. And down to the T, it was like, holy camoli, how do you know all of that? And he uses certain mechanisms or colors in in this case to describe a personality. And it was so down to the spot that for the first time in my life at the age of 30, I felt seen for who I was. Mm. Yeah, And that tremendous gift is like, this is who I'm here to be. There was no question around that. So it poses two questions. The first one is if somebody that I've never seen before is able to see me more than anybody that I've known for 30 years, What's, what's the implications of that if, if he gets all that information? And the second thing is, if I have this personality that wants to be expressed, everybody has that. Yeah. We come to this world with our certain personality that wants to be expressed. Mm-hmm. And everything in our world, it, it, it yearns for it. Like for you, for example, you, you have Violet around you, which is, which is visionary leader personality. You need to have a purpose. You need to you're a visionary you want to make a difference out there yeah and it it finds its way like through the cracks of a rock it finds its way into the world you can start being an engineer which is much more mental and linear but eventually your your violet as i call it kicks in mm. and finds its well and finds its expression so it's your it's our authenticity calling us and which we usually can't resist <laughs> i appreciate that I, I I love the concept of it's not exactly the same language, but similar mm-hmm. in idea is the concept of Dharma. Mm-hmm. Right. So I speak to uh, people who believe in Dharma. Dharma is like almost like a loose translation would be like a destiny, right? Mm-hmm. That that that's that's your soul's destiny per se. But then after I delve into that even further, there's different levels of Dharma. The first level may be just staying alive. That's that's like your purpose but mm-hmm. then there's the maha dharma like your souls your your life mission per se so as we move forward in our own development as a person as a as a man as a as a husband as an entrepreneur whatever identity you want to put on then you can get closer and closer to your maha dharma so i appreciate the way that you articulate it the purple is seeping through the cracks and i appreciate that thank you so Someone who is resonating with this particular conversation, Mm -hmm. what are some of the criteria for them to, that they should pay attention to a particular voice, particular teacher, particular guide? Because there are so many different voices out there, especially on the internet, right? So do you have any mental models to help them discern, hey, you should listen to this particular voice versus all the noises out there? Yeah, it's it's. I think it's really personal. I, I'll speak to some, but I'll give you an example. My my wife, she teaches uh, dance and teaches a bunch of children, and she says certain things, and then she brings a friend in who's a beautiful, strong guy, and he says exactly the same thing, and all the kids are going, "Oh my God, Todd!" And she said, "What am I chopped meat here?" So <laughs> I think we yeah. all need to find that person that truly resonates with us yeah. here. Yeah, for yeah. me, it's that individual. I have my, I've very much resonated with Nidon Walsh's books in the beginning. I love that. Yeah. 
the 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 conversation has got such yeah. a high vibration. Yeah. Yeah, and and Eckhart Tolle's uh, A New Earth, I really like a lot. That's why we've created in the Conscious Business Institute. That's we've, why we've created these programs because we wanted to make these these like these human teachings, these spiritual teachings available for the business world and create a system around that where we can actually build purpose-driven organizations. So it's not just woo-woo stuff, but where we can actually put it on the ground. And what, what I've been missing when I was a venture capitalist is, is to find a pathway to get me from where I was to where I wanted to be it within the business context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could, I could go to yoga retreats. I could drive to Sri Lanka and go, go to Ayurveda thingies or, I could listen to Eckhart Tolle, it would all help me. But going back Monday morning into the workplace was always tough for me because mm -hmm. we switched the system. And so what we've basically created is a, is a curriculum or a pathway that gets people in the professional world from where they are to a more yeah, fulfilled, soul-centered, just more inspiring way of working and doing business. I love that. The way our language it is, you're essentially bridging the physical realm and astral realm, right? So that way it's very actionable, it's more concrete. Because yes. we, after all, we do live in this 3D physical realm. And it's it's okay to have, you know, woo-woo and, 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 you know, a cerebral understanding of, of all that. But ultimately, how to, in my mind, part of the reason why I'm so keen on actionable tactics is such that we can bridge how do we take these insights into our lives because as someone who loves transformation and healing and ceremony and all these things my i believe my job is to 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 bridge right the insights and the and then the, the behavior such that we can actually change yeah. people's lives and 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 not change but improve people's lives the way they they want to right so i really so i really appreciate the way you articulate it yes yeah and those are the critical situations i mean we can all go to yoga retreats and but when when money runs out when our relationships are in havoc when our health is in havoc when our businesses we need to meet the goals that's that's where we need to make it work now i believe so it's kind of a that's yeah, it's just the heaven and earth component. We need to bring it on the earth. So yeah. a lot of people we work with is about building purpose-driven organizations, but many people talk about it. So what we kind of developed is a way, this, this is a step-by-step -step approach to get there, you know, yeah. to get to make those higher principles applicable to our day-to-day -day work. Do you feel that in terms of who this these ideas appeals to do you feel a a a a, a, a uprise a more request more desire for this type of philosophical holistic philosophy there's there's a huge not just uprise but when i again years back when i was as a venture capitalist, I noticed that again, 90% of the people really want to do something different. If you would give them a check and say, you can stay or you can leave, there would be out the door in a minute. So it, that's very sad because we all want to work with fulfillment. We all want to make a difference. We all want to show up and do something cool. We all want to connect with other people and the workplace could be an amazing place to do that. So when we go into organizations and speak to people about these opportunities that it could be possible and here's a pathway to do, the, do it and talk about fulfillment, talk about connection, talk about purpose, they're fully on board. So we just, we just completed a program with a big, big organization in, in, in Europe and we, we had about 70 seats available and they were, I mean, register on a first come first basis and, and and it was sold out in two days it was just done because there's such a yearning in organizations to work in a better way yeah it's a, it's a big pressure hmm. do you so so if you look at sort of the, the marketing awareness framework for a moment so there's the problem mm -hmm. unaware problem aware solution aware and then specifically looking for you right do you mm -hmm. feel that most business owners are in the problem aware or solution aware space. I think they're in, they're in the problem aware space. Yeah, because they're 
they're looking about this uh, like talent engagement is a huge issue especially with millennials uh, we talked again to a large airline manufacturer and they are they are losing 40,000 percent of 40,000 of their people they expect of 140,000 people organization that's a huge amount during the next years due to age but also not hiring new people because they don't want to work there that's a huge problem mm. so they they know that they have to change their culture they know they have to lead uh, in a different way so they're very problem aware mm. uh, and they're trying they're, they're just saying you need to be more flexible you need to deal with uncertainty with different leadership style but how that this is a fundamental shift of thinking mm -hmm. they are many of them don't quite grasp what it entails to do that mm -hmm. so they're looking for change solutions many many organizations but mm -hmm. change is always doing something better doing something more doing something different but not transformation mm -hmm. change is always a, a little improvement within the same thinking yeah so let me give you an example if you Think of Copernicus, for example, 15th century. Think about where? Copernicus in the 15th century, he thought about the world being round instead of flat, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody was thinking the world was flat. So in that context, if you want to go to India or find new things, you would have to go westwards from Spain. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no way you would go eastwards because you would fall off the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what where many companies are. They think, oh, we have to go westwards. We have to go westwards. The thinking change that the world was round opened up into a completely new opportunity that you could go actually the other way around, eastwards. And by that opened up enormous opportunities for the Spanish people mm -hmm. discovering Americas. Huh? So it, it's to shift from wanting to change something to really understand what is transformation, how can I transform my organization and what is the huge possibility that comes from that if i do that because there always is mm -hmm. and many people struggle with that little distinguished dis dis distinction there well yeah because it's taking the leap of faith right it's it's not knowing what this is gonna do because they've never been there again very similar to the COVID situation right i don't yeah. know what's gonna happen uh do i just trust peter or ck right <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. if this fucks up, yeah. you know, fucks up my business, yeah. then, then then we're all fucked, right? So, okay, so yeah, but but here's the deal: uh -huh. um, most people don't know it exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what what we all can do, and this is, I think, the challenge that we're in front of, is most people look at, I know stuff, and if I want to do stuff, I can just change something. So, for example, if you would want to learn how to fly an airplane, you would know what to do. Right, you would go to school, you would learn, and eventually you would fly an airplane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's the the innovation really happens in this space where we don't know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you tell me anything that you don't know that you don't know? Of course not, because I don't know it. <laughs> yeah. There's something that we don't even know exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we don't know America exists because we've never been there. So the, what we can explore as leaders is to, to work with people that can show us the space that there is something that, that, they, that they don't know yet. That's, that's what we really do with organizations. Mm. And when we do that, they see, oh, my God, there's such an opportunity here, mm. which we never knew existed. I like that. So you're leveraging, especially uh, so, social proof, basically. Like, hey, here's someone else who's done it. They follow these tracks. It's safe. The water's okay. You won't die. <laughs> you yeah. can your toe in there without a program kind of a thing. Yeah. So let me ask you a quick question, actually, because you, you had mentioned, I think it was before the early, earlier part of our call, the idea, uh, I don't know if you read the book Second Mountain yet. It's a beautiful book talking about the last name of the author is Brooks, I believe. So mm -hmm. he his assertion is, Effectively, we have two parts of our life. The first part of our life is focusing on getting success, external validation, and so forth. That's the first mountain. Mm -hmm. And then once you reach the peak of the first mountain, you realize success isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Then you start your second mountain. It's the pursuit of fulfillment, mm -hmm. the meaning, and then purpose. Mm -hmm. So 
So here's, so that's the context. So the question I have is, is that now you've been a venture capitalist, you've been in private equity, you've been an entrepreneur. So you climb your first mountain, right? And then you had some awakening, you're like, this is kind of empty, right? <laughs> so then, then you started to pursue fulfillment. So for people who haven't climbed their first mountain per se, do you feel that you, they can effectively skip the first mountain and then go directly to the second mountain? I believe so, because I wanted to be successful, but from day one, I was unfulfilled. I, I didn't really need the first mountain, but I didn't know that there was a different way. I think if I knew that there was a second mountain that I could actually combine six, and it's not, not about not being successful on the second mountain. The second mountain is to combine fulfillment with success. <clears throat> if I knew the second mountain existed, I would have gone straight there. And I think many people today would as well. Yeah, not all. I think many still would want to climb the first mountain because they feel that they need the money or the success or the pat on the shoulders or whatever. But I think many would. Mm. What are some of the, because you have a framework to help mm -hmm. entrepreneurs effectively create their second mountain right off the bat or transition or pivot from the pursuit of profit to both success and fulfillment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would be is a first step that they can take other than taking your course or doing your workshop right so that's an obvious thing right mm -hmm. but other than that what's the first thing that they can try to take that step to make their first pivot i believe it's to know in in their heart that they're they can go straight to the second mountain there is a way to work in a better way yeah, so if, I believe uh, just just to, to to change your belief, there is a way. The first thing, not just knowing, not just believing, but knowing. Yeah. So if if I kind of knew that it was out there, uh, I because I felt it in my gut, but I didn't see any any possibility of that. So I created it for myself, which took many years. <laughs> we don't need to go through that crap, everybody. <laughs> but to to allow yourself to full on believe that you can go straight for the second mountain. It is possible and there's a way to do it. The second point is to find uh, people who have actually done it. You know, Yvonne Choinard, for example, of Patagonia, maybe one. Mm. Um, people that you admire, th there are some who've done it. Not mm. too many that are too popular, but like Richard Branson, for example. Mm. Yeah, there are examples. And to make those people your, your new cornerstones, yeah, your proof of concept kind of people and say, oh, this is how it works. So it can, the whole belief can grow into your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that your entire emotional system starts integrating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then maybe look for the components that, that make it work for you. Mm -hmm. Whether it's our programs or something else, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Let me recap what you said, all right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So first, not just know it, sorry, not just believe it, but know it, and internalize it. I'm going to ask you exactly how to do that in, in a moment, but also find mentors or people that you admire role models, the Richard Branson's, the, the founder of Patagonia, as an example, who are, who have charted the path already. Right. Mm -hmm. And also at the same time, the third step is to find allies who are on the same path as well. So joining your program, joining my program, similar things like that to find allies who can, who are on the path as well. Is that an accurate reflection of what you said? Yes. Yeah. Buckminster Fuller says environment is stronger than willpower. So <laughs> it, we need to have some allies, whether it's books or movies or mentors or people that, that, that we can walk with, that we can share the path with. If, if we don't have that, our environment has a tendency to pull us back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's important. One thing I might did. Yeah. Go ahead. What did you say? It might just be one person. It doesn't really matter who it is, but something that we can resonate with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that it's easy for overachievers, especially that we're, we're fraught with this is like, Hey, only I can do it. <clears throat> so this quote comes in mind. If you want to go fast, go along. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I, that reminds me because it's very easy to get into our head and just say, 
I'm going to do it, but it's also fraught with our own emotional, mental chatter. So definitely find minimally one person that you can do a travel buddy, minimally. But if not, yeah, but even the people that are geniuses and they're going by themselves, they have people that inspire them that they can, there's a resonance with other people. If they are resonating on a, on a C sharp, they find other people that resonate on the, on the C sharp. So that there's something going on. They're not hanging out with the B flat people. <laughs> I love that you brought music in. That's, that's, that's really great. That's, that's awesome. Do you play music by the way? I'm not curious. I, 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 yes, not so much anymore, but I used to. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm hanging out with this thing here with a couple hit out. <laughs> yeah, actually, let me let me ask you a quick question because you have put that in your bio. So, how do you bring the Aikido, the Capoeira, and, and is that helping your pursuit of being that conscious entrepreneurial warrior path? Yeah, it is. I, I, I did the martial arts anal analogy a little earlier, but I realized in Aikido when I started doing it because it's not about entering into a conflict or, or fighting it or nor withdrawing it it's to flow with a conflict that i it, it rippled over into my dreams that i was reacting differently to pressure with, that i had in my dreams and i said wow this is this is kind of powerful stuff and i realized that uh, being on the mat um, which i mentioned earlier we are really on the mat in our life here we're getting constantly attacked with with knives with etc et just in a verbal way or in a in a like with our lives in an emotional way, oftentimes. I realized that um, you can actually flow with these things and have a lot of fun. If you learn how to play Aikido, you can be attacked with three people that have weapons and you can have total fun with it. And you can totally flow with those guys and not, not feel attacked and not feel reactive to them. So the whole idea that there could be intense conflicts out there and you can actually enjoy being part of that that was something that tweaked my mind and to learn that you know aikido is that to integrate it into the body and, and to react to that in a different way again it changes the mindset thank you for sharing that i mm. i i, I ask a little bit of a leading question there because i resonate with it so much it's one thing to have a theoretical conversation about facing your adversity facing difficulty facing hardship facing mm. fire it's another mm -hmm. to step into the ring and you're actually sparring someone. And when you're being pummeled by your opponent and how do you actually remain calm in that area during that time? Mike Tyson says the best. Everyone has a plan to, until you get punched in the face, right? Yep. So, 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 so having a physical practice to me is very important, not just on the physical side, but also on the spiritual side as well uh, mm -hmm. and the emotional side too. So I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to talk about that a bit. Why, why, because you made a conscious decision to create this conscious business institute. Talk about that a little bit, because most people, when they think business, just a instrument to make a living, to make profits, and its job is to maximize profits, right? Talk to us about conscious business. What's for you it means and why you wanted to do more of that? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. First, it's, it came to me rather the other, than, than the other way around. I was always looking for better ways to do business from, as I mentioned, from day one at Anderson Consulting, I said, this is not it. This, this could, it could, it could be so much better. Uh, and I, I kept looking for it and I couldn't find it. And then eventually I jumped in 2003 and uh, in 2004, sitting on a plane to do a workshop in North Carolina, uh, dozing by the by the window at six in the morning, I got, I got this inside Conscious Business Institute. And I said, bam, this this is it. This is what I want to do with my life. It, it just totally shook me up. Had no idea what to do with that at that time. So it took a little courage. But again, it, this idea came to me rather than the other way around. And I know that I'm supposed to do this here. And at first I had no idea what it was because conscious business, the term wasn't around. I'd never heard it before. There was nothing out. The book wasn't out, etc. So to define what that actually is and what it means is, is took, took quite a little bit of time. 
to me, conscious everything comes down to consciousness. Yeah, the way we run our businesses, whether we have money or not, whether we do well, have good relationships, in the end, it all comes down to consciousness because our consciousness is what creates our reality. Yeah, if I go into the world thinking that all my employees are are slackers and I need to push them to get things done, that's how I will show up. This is how the culture of my organization will look like. If I have a different consciousness and think, well, these guys might have a hard time at home and might not be willing to work here, but they're in, inherently able and capable to show up and do something cool, I would show up completely different and the culture that I would create would be totally different. So for everything in our life, it's it's simply a reflection of our consciousness. Every conflict that we have is a reflection of our consciousness. Everything that we create beautifully in our life is a reflection of where we are in our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So our success in life stops growing where we have stopped growing as individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so for me, the entryway consciousness is really the entryway to examine that and to expand our consciousness and then find that everything that we create will will expand through that as well. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the, the tale of that is how do we bring this into teams? How do we bring this into organizational practices, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. It reminds me of another quote, Nicole Braffer, tip of my tongue, Transformational Technology Conference, DTC. She said, mm -hmm. we make what we are. Everything that we do in our business is an amplification of our consciousness. You know, if you changing an analogy a bit, our consciousness is essentially like a, like a sunglasses that we wear. If we look at the world through a lens of everyone's a slacker, everything that I do is going to be a, a, addressing that everyone's a slacker versus everyone inherently want to do good in the world, want to contribute, want to be of service and, and then everything that I do would be to address that. So beautifully said, thank you so much, Peter. Yeah. 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 Maybe on top of that is that, you know, if you look at Bruce Lipton's work that 95% of what we create in our 95% of our decision choices is subconscious mm -hmm. and only 5% is conscious. So we are really remote control beings, if you want to call it at that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why consciousness is so important, because if we want to tap into those 95% and maybe change the remote control a little bit, <laughs> mm -hmm. it all comes down to be becoming more conscious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful, my friend. Well, my jam is consciousness, innovation, business, so I can, and then biohacking, like, and martial arts. So we can, I don't know about you, but I can jam with you for hours and hours but I, I want to be super respectful of your time. Okay. So we had talked about many, many different topics. We talked about the nature of consciousness. We talked about your origin story. We talked a little bit about martial arts. We talked about some tactical ways one could do to ground themselves and center themselves in a time of great uncertainty. What else did we talk about? We talked about ways to find different teachers and allies along the way, right? We also had talked about your program, how you construct and design the program. So out of everything that we talked about, what's one thing, if they leave with just this one thing out of everything that we talked about, would be the first step to implement, to experiment, to, to, to operationalize this conversation, what would that be? Oh. It's not going to be very exciting, but maybe to stop. <laughs> okay, let's more about that. Yeah, to stop and to, again, to become aware. Because, again, as I just mentioned, we are usually remote controlled. We are just rattling along. I find myself on this chair here just wanting to get up and make another phone call without knowing why. We are super remote controlled. And if we don't stop and realize what's actually happening in this moment, that I might be sad or compensating for something or overworked, then the train has run away at that point. So if we want to make something go into a different direction with that train, we need to find that stopping point and find a moment of quietness or find a moment of centeredness and check in with ourselves and say, okay, now how can I operate differently? Maybe right now. Mm. Yeah. Take a pause, reflect. How do I take a different action right now? Mm. So Peter, for 
people that want to follow you, follow your story, join your program, what do we send them to? It's it's either yeah, consciousbusinessinstitute.com. That's one word, long long word, consciousbusinessinstitute.com, and there's everything on there about our programs, about signing up for the newsletter, etc. Beautiful. Peter, I really acknowledge you for just showing up with an open heart, open mind. You know, uh, we went a lot of different spaces as we had talked about. And thank you for being willing to dance with me in this very free form improvisational conversation. And thank you for sharing just your wisdom from a place of experience. You know, you did a lot of different things. Now you're crafting a path to the second mountain where people can achieve both success and fulfillment. So it's not either or, it's both. I just really appreciate you showing up as a leader during this time of uncertainty. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, CK, for putting this together and for walking this path here. Really want to acknowledge you for that. Really appreciate it. With that said, guys, go out and, and, and do what Peter tells you and check out the Conscious Business Institute.